Okay, so today we're going to talk about two different readings, and I'm going to try to stitch them together for you uh, in a way that makes sense. Uh, and they're, they're a little bit disparate from each other. One is this guy, Alistair McIntyre, who we started talking in the last class. He's a virtue ethicist, um, still alive, teaches at Notre Dame, teaches undergraduate classes by, by uh, choice. Uh, the other guy we're going to read is a famous 20th century uh, French philosopher, Jean-Paul Sartre, and we're going to look at his existentialism as a humanism. Uh, and there's some common themes that tie them together. McIntyre actually talks a little bit about Sartre in that reading, and I'm, I'm not presuming that you understand at this point how they fit together, but hopefully by the end of this you will. And I want to start out with this. Um, this is kind of a good distinction to think about. Um, today we're going to talk a lot about two different moral theories, one of which we call relativism, the other one we call emotivism. Now they're both very prevalent in our culture and in our educational culture. We want to get away from them. They're, they're sort of the end of ethics. If we buy into them, we may as well just end the class here and say, yeah, everybody you know, gets whatever grade they get uh, and we're, we're finished. There's no point in studying anything. If relativism is true, or motivism is true, then there's not much point in ethics. Um, and the reason why we're going to look at Sartre is he, he espouses a kind of emotivism. Um, you can see emotivism and relativism at work in our culture by looking at this distinction. When we get into discussions about moral issues, right, things that people consider to be right or wrong, good or bad, how we should order our lives or our goods or our societies or relationships, there's a huge difference between asserting that something is the case and then asserting that something is the case because and then giving some sort of reason or explanation or justification. Um, a lot of times this, this slips out of people's minds. So think about all these controversial issues that you know we would like to talk about. Um, you, you could find hundreds of them. Think about daytime talk shows. Right? I'm sure some of you have indulged every once in a while in watching some people get into an argument. It's probably a moral argument. You should do this, you shouldn't do this. Uh, those, those shows, and they get very heated. Sometimes they throw chairs at each other. The guards have to hold them back, right? Um, that's probably not your experience in, in, in everyday life, I hope. None of you are getting into brawls. Um, but you've probably gotten into some, some heated exchanges about moral issues. Um, when you go home at Thanksgiving or Christmas or Easter or you know, whatever, um, there's certain issues that in polite conversation you're supposed to avoid at the dinner table. Uh, you know what those, what are they? Sex. Sex is one of them. Politics. Politics, religion. Money. Money. Yeah, well, it's interesting because usually people always say politics and religion. And then the other two that vary, because we like things in threes, right? Are either sex or, or money. Now, if you think about these, why are these such hot button things? Well, money is always tied in with all sorts of things. <coughs> How you earn your money, whether you've got enough money, whether other people should have that money or not, what you spend it on, what you shouldn't spend it on. These are things that people get worked up about. Um, consumption and purchasing are not value-neutral things, as we say. Um, sex, well, you know, there's, there's all sorts of ways in which you might be able to screw up your life or enhance it, depending on what you do, you know, in the, in the realm of attraction and dating and sexuality. And people have some pretty strongly held beliefs about that, right? And we also have some pretty strong drives uh, that often bring us into competition with each other run us into societal norms, um, make us want to you know, choose this rather than that. Uh, politics, what is politics about? It's about who has power, who gets to decide important things. You know, who should rule? Um, and then religion, you know, why do people get so worked up about religion? Well, you know, if there is a God, Sartre, for example, says there isn't a God. We're going to look at his, his stuff today. And we're not going to go very deep into any of these sort of theological issues, but if there is a God, and God's what you know 
people who believe in God make him or it or whatever out, out to be as this you know, source of all value and goodness, well, that would really reorient things, wouldn't it? Uh, and if there isn't a God, well, that would really reorient things as well. And people often have very deep emotional investments in these, these issues. And so what happens when they get into discussions? Um, if they're being reasonable, if they're being rational, if they're acting like what human beings could do, they would say, I think this is the case. They'd make a claim. And then they'd say, because. And then they would give some sort of justification or some sort of reason. I think that you shouldn't spend your money on candy because it'll rot your teeth. You know, it's kind of a trivial example. Um, I think you shouldn't spend your money on candy because I think you should put it towards a merest education, a little less trivial example. Those are moral claims. I'm giving you a reason. <coughs> That's different than just saying, I don't think you should spend your money on candy. Or, I think capital punishment is a okay Or, I think capital punishment is wrong. Or, people who believe in capital punishment are uh, barbarians with a medieval mentality. Or, people who don't believe in capital punishment are weaklings who coddle criminals and victimize the victims once again. Um, you notice those are all just assertions that. They're not saying anything because. They're not giving a reason. And what happens when we get into discussions about these, these issues? It turns into, you guys are familiar with this from experience? This side says this, this side says this, and they just shout at each other? Is that a pretty common experience, right, in our society? Common experience in, in, in every society, by the way. Um, but successful societies teach their members how to get to the because and how to reason with each other. It doesn't mean we'll actually convince each other. But if you can give reasons why you think something is the case, you're going further than just yelling, just shouting. Um, unfortunately, our culture often tells us that the key thing is just to express ourselves. Express your point of view. Make your opinion count. Your opinion is really only going to count if somebody else could find it reasonable. Um, and that's where the because comes in. So what happens oftentimes in our society, and this is where relativism and emotivism come in, is the focus on this rather than moving beyond to try to find some sort of reason, some sort of common ground by which we could, we could work these things out and justify these things. Um, relativism says that there are no actual objective moral values or norms or even you know th things like theories that would hold for everybody. They hold only for particular individuals or for cultures or societies or groups that are relative to them. So, when you hear somebody say something like, well, that's true for me, but it's not true for you. That's an example of relativism. Uh, if they really mean, yeah. Um, why is it an example of relativism and not just an example of being relative? There's a difference between being relative. You can say that something appears to be true from my perspective, and that's being relative, okay. right? But if you're saying, well, something is true for me, but not true for you, the word true, the way we actually use that word, means that it applies to more than just one thing, one perspective. You can say something appears true from a perspective. Okay. That's not really a big deal. For instance, um, let's say we take a, a, a sort of silly moral claim. I used this example in the last class. Um, I would guess that you would think that drowning puppies is, is, is wrong. Yeah. Um, now, I'm not actually saying I hold this belief, but um, <laughs> to me, it seems that drowning puppies could be a perfectly justifiable thing. If you have too many puppies, you know, I mean, it's been done for a long time, and in a lot of areas, you can put them in a bag and throw them in the river, and then you don't have any puppy problem, you know, and, and they're out of their misery. They, they would otherwise maybe starve or something. 
And you know, some people just like to drown puppies too. Maybe I'm one of those people. Um, now, do we want to say that, well, you know, that's true for me. It's not true for you. It, for you, it's true that drowning puppies is bad. For me, drowning puppies is good. They're both equally true. They're both equally valid. That's not the same thing as saying, I have that belief. I mean, you know, and actually, I don't. I want to stress this again. <laughs> um, but let's say I do. It's one thing to say, I have this belief, and you have that belief, and they're in contradiction with each other. Or it appears this way to me from my perspective, and it appears that way to you from your perspective. It's a whole other thing to say. They're both equally true. They're both equally uh, valid. Um, one is, it's a good point. One is saying think, things are relative to points of view. Another is relativism. Yeah. So, stating that they're both equally true is relativism. Yes. Okay. Or, or you could actually say they're both equally false. Too. <laughs> Maybe there's nothing that's that's true because nothing is true from any universal point of view. Okay. Um, the the trouble is, is it puts everything on the same level. So it becomes very difficult to say then um, how anybody could in fact be be wrong. So if you want to be able to say condemn the Nazis. Everybody picks on the Nazis, but they probably, you know, still get some mileage on that because they were pretty bad. Um, if you want to say that what they did was wrong, say committing the Holocaust, you can't be a relativist. Because if you're a relativist, you have to say, well, it was it was right for them. It wouldn't be right for me or for, for our society, but it was right for their society because that was their their set of norms. If you want to be able to make judgments about whether things on a higher level are right or wrong, or true or false, or things like that, you can't afford to be a relativist. Uh, in a much more basic way, if somebody wants to be, I always use this example, if you want to be a relativist, let me know, because then I can give you the F right away. And then when you come to me and you say, I don't think that's fair, Dr. Sadler, I can say, well, of course you don't think it's fair, and it's not fair to you. But it's fair to me. That's the way I understand fair then suddenly you're not a relativist anymore, right? Because when it comes down to it, most of us are not relativists. Uh, this guy, uh, Alan Bloom, wrote this book, The Closing of the American Mind, years and years ago, and he said, all college undergraduates are infected with relativism. Um, I don't think that's actually the case. I think that our society pushes it a lot, and our educational institutions will often push it, because we're, we're afraid of making judgments. Because if we make judgments, then, then we're being judgmental. Right? And it's not nice to be judgmental. None of you want to be labeled as judgmental, right? Well, correct, but also providing enough for being a relativist, you're being judgmental in that case. Yeah, that's an internal problem with relativism. Right? right. I'm here to actually say it's okay for you to be judgmental. Just have some reasons why you're making the judgment. Try, you know, giving some, some justification for why you're saying this is right or this is wrong. As a matter of fact, I would say you have to be judgmental. If you're not, you're, you're, you know, you're going to let a lot of things slide that shouldn't slide. And you're going to go along with a lot of things that, that should, you shouldn't go along with. Um, very often people talk in a relativistic way when they want to manipulate people. Um, and that's, you know, sort of secretly there. And, or they want to avoid criticism. Oftentimes it can be good to undergo criticism. So that's relativism. A motivism, which is what McIntyre talks a bit more about, and, and he actually, this is a, one of his major books, After Virtue, um, he begins this, and I'll, I'll put some references to this in Ireland for you. I'm not going to require you to read it, but it could hurt you. Um, he talks about a motivism as being sort of the, the, the general moral theory governing our, our culture today. Motivism is a little bit different than relativism. Motivism will also put a stop to ethics, but it'll do, for, it'll do so in a different way, for a different reason. Um, the emotivist can say people will give reasons, and it might not just be, those reasons might just not be, well, it just appears this way to me, or this is my, my culture's norms, or something like that. But ultimately, those reasons are just sort of window. What the emotivist is, is committed to is saying something like this. What moral judgments, moral values, ways in which we order goods, our lives, relationships, what those boil down to is just our subjective preferences. 
So if I say drowning puppies is bad, it's not because drowning puppies really is bad and that's part of the, the way the world is or anything like that. It's just I feel bad about drowning puppies. You know, and I feel good in saying, let's not drown puppies. That makes me feel like a good person. Um, and, and there are people out there who make their moral claims and make their moral decisions basically on the basis of wanting to feel good about themselves or not feel bad about themselves. Maybe to feel morally superior to other people um, or to avoid shame or something like that. There are people out there who, who take their sides and, and take their stances and it's basically the equivalent of, of um, as one of the proponents of the emotivist theory said, it's basically like saying, yay, you know, not drowning puppies, yay, drowning puppies, boo. Um, it, it's just a preference. If emotivism is correct, then all this justification stuff and the moral theories that we use, these are just a mask for our wish to get things to go the way we want them to, to make us feel good. Um, now there's a further use though, we, we also use this stuff to try to make other people feel the way that we do too. If you're an emotivist, it's A-OK -okay to try to make everyone else feel like you. Um, because, you know, the ultimate basis is your feelings. So, <coughs> if I don't want you to drown puppies, or kittens for that matter, or, you know, whatever, um, I should bring pressure to bear on you and try to make you feel bad if you do that sort of thing. Um, on the other hand, if I want, you know, you to let me drown puppies because I'm a sadist or something like that, then I would, you know, come up with some sort of argument that makes you feel bad for interfering with my rights to do as I wish with my property or something like that. But it's really about my wish to drown puppies or, or kittens or what have you. You can see this is going to be a big problem, right? If, if all that morality is, is just our subjective preferences, um, what's the point in studying all this? I guess just to get good at tricking each other. So you learn a little con so you can bring that out to make people feel a certain way. Learn a little Plato, do the same thing. If that's the case, then, then we may as well end the semester here. Right? So relativism and emotivism, I'm not saying there aren't any people out there who hold these theories. They would prevent you from doing any real study in ethics. They would prevent you from actual growth, both intellectually and So McIntyre is going to take off from this, this starting point. And McIntyre, let, let's do a little recap from, from um, a little bit that we talked about last time. McIntyre said that um, he used the term moral theory. He said that plain persons, so that's you. That's also me insofar as I live a life outside of the confines of this classroom and my, my uh, uh, academic life. All of us live out some sort of moral theory. Some people actually are emotivists, right? Some people are just using value judgments and moral uh, language to manipulate people, right? To coerce them into doing things. Um, does that mean that everybody is? No. But, but that's um, one possible moral theory that we can have. And our society often steers us towards it. Our culture, whether we like it or not, does in fact steer us towards emotivism, in part by discouraging us from actually giving good reasons. You know, when somebody, if you've been told since you were a kid, um, your opinion is good because it's your opinion and you should act on your feelings, you are probably going to end up, at least at early on, becoming an emotivist, right? If you don't have anything else telling you, no, you should make a decision on other grounds. Um, and when um, McIntyre talks about this, he talks about this in terms of this guy, John Paul Sartre who we're going to talk a little bit more about towards the, the end of the class, um, one of the readings for today. 
Not everybody's an emotivist, though, right? When you guys make moral decisions, and you've made a lot of moral decisions in, in your life, what other bases might you have made them on? Now, you, you probably didn't think of it in terms of utilitarianism. Did anyone, when they were deciding you know, what, what they needed to do in their last crisis, say, well, what, what would Jeremy Bentham say? No? None of you, none of you did that? Probably you're not going to do that later on either. But now you at least know it's, it's utilitarianism. Uh, what utilitarianism is, if we want to put it in a nutshell, the approach that it takes is to say, well, you know, when we make moral decisions, decision, decisions that really count, things about right and wrong, good and bad, the best thing to do, or the right thing to do, is that which will benefit the majority of the people, or the, the greatest number, and harm the, the least amount. So you could do like a cost-benefit analysis. You're going to do some sort of action and it will affect your community or your family. You look at how it's going to affect all the different members, and you try to pick the thing that will do the most good and the least harm. Now that means that um, you can't just do whatever it pleases you, right? As oftentimes doing what will produce the most benefit and the least harm for most people. Is that always the thing that pleases you the most? Think about, you know, you get into a conversation with somebody and you think that they're a jerk. And you'd like to tell them that. Um, but they're friends with a lot of people that you care about. and. If you were to indulge yourself in what you'd like to do, you'd like to really call that person a lot of names and, and you know, maybe kind of uh, emphatically phrased, you know? And you, you, you try to put them in the box that they deserve to be in. Uh, that's what you feel like doing, right? Um, but you realize, oh, if I do that, that would feel good to me. And, and yeah, of course, that would hurt that other person, but they're a jerk and they got it. But it would hurt all these other people, too. And so what do you do? You bite your lip, and you don't say what you think, and you take a deep breath, and, you know, no, you don't. <laughs> you say it. When I was your age, I, I said it, too, actually. <laughs> but I, I had to learn from experience. A utilitarian would say, well, you know, let's see how it works out for the, for, you know, the majority. So you can't just indulge whatever it is that you, you want to do. That's a different moral theory. That's a different way of orienting your life. A person who has a utilitarian moral theory is going to act differently than somebody who's just following their desires, aren't they? Now, the utilitarian is not committed to saying that anything is truly right or wrong. Um, one of the things about this is, you know, if it, were, if it would work out um, good overall for the majority of the people, do some bad things to other people. Like, let's say um, we could enslave just 5% of the population, and they'll have no rights whatsoever. And we can make them work like dogs, and we can do anything that we want to them, and that's going to make our, the rest of our lives so much better. Um, if you really had a trade-off like that, the utilitarian would say, yeah, that, that sounds okay. That, that would be okay to do. Now, another way you might go is uh, along sort of what McIntyre calls Kantian or <coughs> deontological. I think the word duty for use of that uh, lines. It, it, some people would say, no, you can't do that. Slavery is wrong. <coughs> it just is wrong. Maybe we could come up with some argument for it, but we're not going to go there. Right? You, you don't enslave them. Uh, that would be a, a sort of duty-based thing. You have a duty not to treat people in a certain way. You have a duty to treat people in certain ways. Um, now, you might be able to provide some sort of you know, reason for this, or you might just say, well, we just have our duties, and I know what they are, and I'm going to do them, even if it kills me, or even if it goes against my desires and inclinations, or even if it doesn't benefit the, the majority. Like here, here's one example. Uh, we've used this sort of thing. 
over and over again in, in philosophy. Um, what if you could go back in time and kill Hitler? Should you do so? Would that be a good thing to do or a bad thing to do? Because you'd be killing a human being, right? Yeah, how does the, the, the reason, forget, by the way, any sort of worries about, well, if I went back in time and altered history, then would I exist? Don't, don't worry about that, stuff, right? Because that gets complicated. But what were you going to say? Then I can't answer your question because it was going to go. Oh, it was those time travel. Okay. <laughs> so let's, let's think about this. One person, it's, it's wrong to kill people, right? But what did this guy Hitler do? <coughs> yeah, he didn't just kill one person. He was responsible for millions. Now, did he, you know, individually kill all these people? No, but he was, he was the guy at the top, and and given the, you know, the, the Nazi um, ideology, if you would have taken out the top guy, things could have <coughs> fallen apart, actually. Um, so maybe you could have prevented, say, the Holocaust. Let's just say just the Holocaust itself, and we don't worry about, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Gypsies or any other people. Just the, just the Jews that were killed, six million people. Um, so one guy, one life as opposed to six million. If you're a utilitarian, that's a no-brainer, right? Kill Hitler. I think most people here would do it. I would, actually, myself. Um, I, I'm not a, a deontologist. I'm actually not a utilitarian either. But, um, but isn't it your duty to protect others, though, if you think about ah, it? Well, then you would have to weigh duties against each other. Right. right. Yeah. And so maybe you could come up with a good Kantian or deontological reason for but one of the problems is you can say, well, you have a duty to, to protect life, even if it's the life of a complete, you know, mass murderer. Um, I, I'm bringing this up not to try to solve this here, but just so you can see some of, some of the differences. So we've got three main moral theories in play right now that are kind of common stances in our society. And you don't see people coming out and saying, well, Kant says X, Y, Z, so therefore I'm going to do this. But you do see a lot of people that are very duty driven, right? And you do see a lot of people that are sort of uh, cost benefit analysis driven. And then you do see a lot of people who really, they may talk about morality, but it's just sort of a mask for their own desires, preferences, feelings, that sort of thing. McIntyre talks about these as options that you may recognize yourself already in or, or recognize other people in. He also talks about another one as being uh, what we're going to call virtue ethics. He uses Aristotle as an example here and he says the plain person, that's you again, is a proto-Aristotelian, meaning you don't realize it yet but unless you're fitting into one of these, you're more likely in line with, at least on the start, with virtue ethics. <clears throat> virtue ethics understood in an Aristotelian way. It's part of the reason why we're going to study this guy Aristotle later on in the semester. Um, now, McIntyre brings up another thing that, that's very important at this point, too. So he says moral theories are really key. What else is really key narratives. Um, what's a narrative? Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like the story of your life. Well, that's one particular kind of narrative. It uses the word story. That's, that's a good synonym for narrative. Um, movies are narratives. Um, when you do a report, like let's say, somebody in here was international business? You do a report on, say, what took place from November of 2011 to today in the Japanese stock market. You produce a lot of data, but you put it together in some sort of coherent story. You're making a narrative. Um, we have narratives of all sorts of things. Cartoons are narratives. You know, when Bugs Bunny tricks uh, Yosemite Sam, that's a classic narrative. When somebody tells a story on Jerry Springer about how they were cheated on by whoever, you know, that's a narrative. When we reconstruct where all the money went to in 2008, that's a narrative. You know, all of these are stories at one form or another. And we live through these, right? 
Because what is your life like? Well, it has a beginning. It's going to have an end sooner or later, hopefully much later than, than sooner. Because uh, all of you are very young. Um, and I wish you very long, productive lives. Um, and a whole bunch of stuff's going to happen in, in the middle, right? Is it all just a bunch of random incidents, sound and fury signifying nothing, and to use the old Shakespearean phrase? No, there's, there's connections, right? McIntyre is interested in two kinds of narratives. He's interested uh, in, in this piece, at least. He's interested in, in narratives of, of moral progress. And he's also interested in narratives of what we can call moral decline. And it's, it's kind of interesting. There are a lot of cultural narratives out there that see the world in these terms. Like, um, at one time, human beings were all very good, and then something came along and screwed us up, and we've just been getting worse and worse, and that's why we're a bunch of heartless bastards now. Um, that, that's a uh, narrative of moral decline, isn't it? Or, you know, we started out as just, you know, basically one step up from, from apes and um, we've been, you know, we eventually we've developed society and agriculture and laws and our laws were pretty inhumane for a long time and they've been getting more and more humane and our society has been getting better and better and better and we're all becoming, you know, um, really good people. The story of moral progress. Both of these are probably false too, by the way. Uh, narratives can be true false, depending on whether they're, they're, you know, things jive with the way things actually are. Um, you can do this for individual people, too, can't you? Um, some people, their lives start out pretty good, and then they screw it up, and they keep screwing it up, and they screw it up more and more and more and more. Um, the stories of addiction are like that quite often. You, know, you, get, you get yourself addicted to meth or crack or something like that. Heroin, it's, it's pretty much over until you get out of that <coughs> treatment and then you may have more progress. Um, it doesn't have to be addiction, though. It could be all sorts of other things. People make fateful choices. One second. People make fateful choices that put them on a path, which then it becomes hard to get yourself away from. Once you have a trajectory set, it takes choice, right, to make yourself go a different way. Um, or, you know, on the other hand, people sometimes come to the, themselves and say, wow, <coughs> That's a lot better than where I am. I want to be there. What do I have to do to get there? And that's, that's a narrative of, of moral progress. And for the Aristotelian view, we don't start out all the way at the bottom, and we don't start out all the way at the top. We start out somewhere in the middle, and we have to you know, slowly build step by step by step. And there's no one <coughs> single decision that solves everything or fixes everything. It's a bunch of different things along the way. And we're going to come back to this theme of progress and or decline in narratives in you know, just a few minutes towards the end of the class. Where are you going to <coughs> so You kind of answered, I was going to ask, basically, like, when it comes to moral progress or decline, is it kind of like the idea that if you keep doing a bad behavior, the more you do it, the more it becomes your norm and you don't realize that yes. it's bad? Yes, okay. exactly. Um, the, what we call the vicious person, the person who's developing bad habits not only develops habits of doing things badly, they develop a different mentality, a different mindset. Um, I want to make a sort of change of gears now and, and go and talk about this guy, John Paul Sartre, and talk a little bit about motivism and, and choice. And then we'll come back to it in just a few minutes. So the reading that I had you guys look at is this um, existentialism is a humanism. Like I said, Sartre, important 20th century uh, philosopher, French guy, if you want to see how his philosophy actually plays out in, in lives, there, there is a, um, a narrative that you could read. He wrote a book, he wrote a, a set of books called The Paths to Freedom, I think it's translated as. And the first one was called The Age of Reason. And his characters in, the, in there sort of exemplify his philosophy. Um, they're not very sympathetic characters. So if you're really attracted to start reading them, I turn you off. I know it certainly did for me. 
because I went through a Sartre phase myself when I was your age. Um, if you also look at his life, he was not a particularly good guy. Um, he, uh, I'll tell you just one tip that about him. He had a, another philosopher, Simone de Beauvoir, um, who was also pretty, you know, pretty important philosopher in her own, own right. Beautiful woman, brilliant. Uh, Sartre himself was quite ugly. Uh, he actually had eyes going off in different directions. He kind of looked like a toad. Um, and he cheated on him multiple times. Um, as a matter of fact, he even, if I remember right, uh, tried to get her to cheat on him so he wouldn't feel bad, as bad about him cheating on her. So it gives you an idea of, you know, the viewpoint of this guy. has lived out. Now, he would have said, well, you know, philosopher's life and his, his philosophy are two different things, um, but maybe they are connected. Now, Sartre starts out talking about God not existing. And the reason why he's, he's interested in that, he thinks if there is a God, then we have a human nature. Because, you know, God would have created us, and God would have made us all a certain way. So what would make us, you know, all a certain way? We're going to talk more about that over the course of the semester. What would be our essence, we would say? Maybe it's something like rationality or some sort of potentials that we would all develop together. Um, Sartre doesn't think that we have anything like that. He says existence, where you are right now, what you come into the world with, precedes essence. Um, so you have your feelings, preferences, your situation that you're thrown into, uh, your background, and it does not it's not the same as everybody else's. It makes you you. And then you decide what you're going to make of it. The great theme in Sark is decision. That's where he's a motivist. Um, I'm going to read you a little bit from, from this. This is on uh, page three of the one that I put together for you. It says, when we say, now he's going to use some gender specific language here. When we say that man chooses himself, we do mean that every one of us must choose himself. But by that we also mean that in choosing for himself, he chooses for all men. For in effect of all the actions a man may take in order to create himself as he wills to be, there is not one which is not created at the same time of an image of man such as he believes he ought to be. To choose between this or that is at the same time to affirm the value of that which is chosen. When you make a choice, you, you're, unless you're totally crazy, you're choosing what you think is better, right? Sartre is saying the very act of choosing makes it better. So why be a virtue ethicist or a deontologist or a utilitarian ultimately for somebody like Sartre, because you chose it. And there's no other deeper reason. Ultimately, it just comes down to you choose it. So, you know, if you're a complete bastard who, you know, drowns puppies for fun and um, cheats, you know, old widows out of their, their livelihood, <coughs> throws them out on the street, and then, um, you know, sneaks up behind uh, people on crutches and kicks their crutches up from them, if that's what you choose to be, and that, that's, you know, probably a bad way to be, I think all of us would say, that's what you chose. So for you, that's good. Uh, you're going to have a hard time making a case to other people, but that, that's okay, because you're choosing it. If you cheat on your spouse, uh, and then suddenly revise your views about cheating so that cheating really isn't a bad thing, you can choose that. I, I had so many friends when I was in graduate school that were um, revised their views about sexual morality when it, it became inconvenient for them uh, you know, because they were married or something like that. Um, and I remember being quite kind of struck by that. Um, on the other hand, if you choose to devote your life to serving the poor, the only reason why that has any value is because you chose it. It doesn't have any value in and of itself. Sartre would say, this is, this is Sartre's emotionalism. Um, you see what that does to moral judgments, right? 
Sartre thinks that he's liberating people by, by saying this, but he's really just sort of pulling the, the rug out, isn't he? If the only reason why you, up to this point, I'm guessing most of you have chosen to be good people, more or less, up to this point. If the only reason why you have chosen to be good people up to this point is because you've chosen it, and you can't give any other grounds, it doesn't really have much value, does it? Or maybe it's just your emotions. Again, emotions. Maybe you just like being a good person. And if you didn't, you'd be a bad person. You'd be perfectly fine with that, except it makes you feel good to, to do good things. That's where this goes to. Now, Sartre goes a little bit farther than this. Um, very often, philosophers can't be reduced just to an ism or something like that. And one of the things that Sartre is saying here that's kind of interesting, Let's say you adopt his point of view. So you're an existentialist, you're a, to some degree, an, an, an emoticist. Um, when you decide how it is that you're going to arrange your moral universe, what you're going to value, what you're going to say is good, what, what you're going to say is bad, you don't really have a choice. You have to do that for other people. They may not accept what you say. You know, so for instance, when, when Charles Manson says, Killing people is a great thing. We, we don't say, yeah, okay, Charles Manson said so, so I think you know, we'll all go along with that now, right? We say, he's nuts. But he's actually not just deciding for himself, he's deciding for humanity in general. If you decide to be um, totally ruthless, you're saying everybody should be like that. If you decide that we should, in fact, serve those who are more vulnerable than ourselves, and take care of them. You're saying everybody should be like that, that that's a good thing. That goes along with the structure of human action. So whether you like it or not, the story that is your life is not just a story for you. It's a story of how you're trying to make sense out of how a person ought to be. This goes back to McIntyre's point about it. None of you, I think none of you have actually like sat down and said, what is the, the basic human good, and how shall I achieve it? Did any of you ever do that on the weekend? No? Maybe you will this weekend. I don't know. Probably. Um, but you have thought to yourself, what do I want? What, what do I need to do in order to get that? What do I have to do to put myself on that track? Am I making progress towards that, or am I actually going away from that? And sometimes you actually pass through plateaus where you say, wow, I thought this was really good. But there's something even better beyond that that I need to change my, my priorities for now. Um, that would be moral progress. Sartre is kind of stuck. Virtue ethics would take us further than that. Um, so this is the last thing I'm going to talk about. With these points of view, once you've got it, you've got it. Utilitarianism is pretty straightforward, it is a theory. Um, you know, you, you end up doing something like a cost-benefit analysis. You can get better at doing it. You can get worse at, or you can be worse at doing it. But once you've got the basic principles down, that's it, right? You can recognize the basic principles. Okay, okay. Same thing with with uh, Kant stuff. Even though it is difficult, once you've got it down, that you know, you're, you're done. Now it's just a matter of application. With virtue ethics, this is one of the points McIntyre is trying to make to you in this this piece. There's a, there's a back and forth between the moral theory and the narrative. You never fully understand a moral theory until you've lived it out. Um, when it comes to virtue ethics. You often don't fully understand your narrative that you're living until you can get a vantage point on it later on. Like, you know, think about what you thought was important to you in high school. You guys are now three years into college, at least one of these four years. Um, have your priorities changed? Have your evaluations of what was important and what you want to be thinking about and spending your time on, is that probably radically changed, right? Your narrative has changed. You've gotten a better grasp of it. When you went back home for like the, maybe not the first time that you went back home, but a couple times after that, you got. You looked at some of the people who didn't go to college in high school, and you said, I don't have as much in common with these people anymore. Um, 
they were still in the same narrative. Right? Um, the way it works is in the narrative of your life, if you're making moral progress, things get clearer and clearer and clearer to you as you go on. On the other hand, if you make the wrong choices, there are some choices that you can make that place you in a path where you can see less and less clearly, where you develop something like what McIntyre calls a moral blindness. Um, so the example that I'm going to leave you with, think about wealth. Why do we want money if we're normal? There's, there's reasons, you know, there's some crazy reasons, like some people like to roll around in dollar bills, but, you know, that's a weird thing, right? Why do normal people want money? You need it. Why? Yeah? To provide for your family. Okay, that's a great reason, to provide for your family. It's, it's a means, and in this part of it at least, your family is the ends, right? And which is the higher value, the money or your, your family and the life that you can have? The family is the higher value. And so if you have your priorities right, um, you know, think about a sort of common problem that comes up in the course of people's lives. Do you take the job that's going to require you to spend very little time with your family but is going to generate a lot more wealth? Um, or do you make the sacrifice and do without some things but spend the time with your family? That's a fateful decision in that it places you, there's one path here and there's another path here, right? And if you decide that wealth is the most important thing, which is what, you know, Sartre would say, if you make that decision, you are in fact deciding between wealth and family. And you're, and you're not just saying, Wealth and family for me, you're saying wealth and family for everybody. That's espousing a moral theory. If you make the decision that something that's just a purely instrumental good, wealth, is the good, and you center your life around that, you will develop a kind of moral blindness to other values. And so after a while, it will be difficult for you to see what it's doing to you. And you've all seen narratives in which this takes place, right? <coughs> Maybe you've lived out part of those narratives. Uh, or your, your friends have, or your, your relatives have. You've all seen all sorts of Hollywood uh, cultural productions of these, right? Because that's a real life moral decision that has to be made. And notice, when people are making this, they don't always frame it in terms of moral theories and say to themselves, you know, how should I how should I arrange this? They, they're on the spot and they have to decide, do I take this job, which is going to have these consequences, or do I stick with this job? <coughs> they think to themselves in terms of concrete goods. They don't say, oftentimes, my family. They, they say, uh, my kid so-and-so, my kid so-and-so, my uh, husband or wife. You know, They think in terms of real, concrete, actual goods and values. And they, and they think in terms of real dollar amounts. Do I take the $100,000 job or stick with the $50,000? <coughs> That's the way narratives work. Um, I'm going to give you in Eiler an assignment that has you do some reflection on your own life and, and whether it's been a narrative largely of moral progress so far or, or a narrative of uh, moral decline. Um, so, so look for that in, in Eiler under assignments, and I'll see all of you on uh, Tuesday. Uh, and the next class will be a bit more um, interactive discussion. This is good, though. Good participation. Will this assignment be due by next Tuesday? Yes. Okay. Uh, and, and all the assignments um, not only will be posted in iLearn, but you'll, you'll um, post your work in iLearn as well.